Hello, and welcome once again to the Near Zone's History of the Blood War series, everything you need to know about the War of Devils and Demons. I am your host, Jay Unwuka, and in this episode, I present part two of my overview of the Devil Military Order. In part one, I gave you the basic layout of a single legion. If you want to know more about the details of how a legion is composed, I'd encourage you to check out the first part. In this episode, I'm going to give more of a big picture analysis, why the devils would organize this way, what their goals are, and what the larger structure of devil society could look like. Again, just as a disclaimer, a lot of this is based on my speculation, putting together various elements given by the lore and adding details based on the history and institutions of our world. The first question to be answered here is, why a military structure? This might seem to have an obvious answer. The devils are a warring force, therefore they're like a military. But let's go a step further in two respects. Maybe that's two steps further. Anyway, on the one hand, let's not just say that warriors must have a military structure. Let's try and think about what the structure accomplishes and not just the purpose that we've placed on it is. On the other, we could imagine a devil kind that primarily has a feudal organization still having a military group within it. That is to say, I'm not just trying to describe the military aspect of a devil culture. What I'm proposing here is that their entire society is based on a military structure, not just that they are a society that has a military. In my view, the devils should prefer this military structure rather than, say, a church structure or a feudal one or a business, etc., because Military structures are primarily based on supervising people. Other structures are primarily about places. A business person doesn't have control over their employees outside the workplace. A priest is generally installed at a church. A feudal lord owns their tracts of land. Even a modern nation state's jurisdiction is mainly a matter of area borders. In contrast, when put in command of an army, a general has the same formal authority if they are 30,000 miles away as they would if they were embedded with their troops. Now I know this is a claim that can be debated, but I think this point is strong enough given that I'm not saying that this is the only way that the devils could organize, only the one that I believe best fits the diabolic nature where oppression, domination, and control are their goals. Regardless of any one military's exact makeup, military structures in general are mainly about a small group, the commanders, directing and controlling a large group, the soldiers. Militaries excel at discipline and forcing everyone below to follow the will of the head. Both of these aspects aren't just central to the devil's blood war strategy, but also to their essential qualities. Plus, rigid order provides a playground for intrigue and subterfuge. The variety of differing ranks and posts are brass rings for the ambitious to attain. Competing chains of command can allow a crafty operator to play officers one against another and come out ahead. We know that intrigue is a way of life among many devils, so it makes sense if their whole society can be gamified, so to speak. Another benefit that devils gain from having a militarized system is a clear way to activate and deactivate troops as needed. Most of us will be familiar with the idea of a military having reserves. The quote unquote civilian devils would all be reserves in this system. Rank is still critical to them as far as social status, but these reserved civilians are usually not called upon to fight in the actual blood war battles. However, if a reserve troop does need to be activated, those troops will know exactly where they're supposed to go and who they're supposed to report to. So, considering the big why to have been answered well enough for us to move on, we'll approach the next biggest question. How is the active blood war force controlled? I went over the upper command in the last video as well, and to recap, the Lords of the Nine, that is to say, the Great Arch Devils, don't command the blood war forces directly. Instead, each of them has their own vast custodian army. I'm going to skip over the custodian forces for now, but I might come back to them in a later treatment. The active diabolic forces in the Blood War come under the overall command of the Dark Eight, a cabal of elite pit fiends. Briefly, their names and roles are 
Burkos, who is in charge of recruiting allies and procuring souls, Beelzefon, who organizes supply, Zimimar, who is in charge of discipline and encouragement, Zapan, who decides disputes between officers, Zybos, who oversees promotions, demotions, and transfers, Corin, in charge of espionage, Dagos, who leads strategy planning, and Piarza, at the head of researching new magic as well as other means of aiding the devils to victory. Uh, there's a slight change in the roles given here, mainly in Furkas's mortal relations and Zapan's immortal relations, which is to say diplomacy. Um, and these are given in the book uh, Hellbound, The Blood War. I felt that these were fairly limited in scope. For that reason, I decided to have Furkas in charge of all outreach, both mortal and immortal, and then I used Zapan's preference for dealing with other immortals to make him a kind of chief military judge. This isn't really about judging law as such, it's more about, as I said, settling disputes so that order in the military is maintained. If you'd like to find out more about the original roles ascribed to the Dark Eight, I definitely encourage you to look out Hellbound um, because uh, that's a really good resource for the Blood War. Um, especially the section, the Dark of the War, is where you're going to find the uh, Dark Eight and all of the other uh, lore about how the devil armies and uh, even the demons and such are organized. As you can figure from their roles, the Dark Eight are not meant to be battlefield commanders, but top managers, like an army general staff. Each member of the Eight has the rank to take personal command of any Blood War army, but they mostly remain hidden and secret. They are said to meet four times a year in the Fortress Malshim, located on Nessus, the Ninth Hell. They leave the outward leadership to the generals of the three commands. Uh, before we move there, I want to give my opinion about a smaller but still significant piece of the lore. In the older sources such as Hellbound, it is stated that Dagos directly controls the three commands by virtue of being in charge of strategy. I think this is an obvious reading of the relationship, but not necessarily a good reflection on the connection between strategy planning and battlefield command. Rather than thinking of Dagos as the author of every strategy, I see them as laying out big picture goals which are then left for the generals to execute. Dagos would determine where certain generals should spend their resources but should not micromanage personnel the way that the old planner books describe. If anyone had that duty, it would be Zybos. I feel that this relation better represents the idea of the Dark Eight being far above and far removed from the active fighters something that seems to be a clear element in the several references to them. Now we come to the three commands themselves. The method of dividing up the commands that I'll present is mostly speculation, but there is some confusion which is already caused by the sources. Hellbound states that the commands have the same areas that our world has. The third command covers the land, the second command covers the water, primarily the river Styx, and the first command which are the elites, are the air forces. However, I don't believe that this makes much sense. We can see obviously that, even though the river Styx is a vital responsibility, the lack of other waterways in the lower plains leaves the second command with relatively little to do. Also, unlike in our world, flight for the devils doesn't require machines or expertise. Relatively low-level devils, such as spinagons, are able to fly, so there isn't much need for a separate air force. Still, the order of command prestige, third being the lowest and first highest, is carried throughout the sources, so I think that's a good assumption to keep. As I talked about in part one, the sword-shield-drag distinction is first and foremost referring to the individual legion focuses. However, in a broader sense, the commands do stand in some analogy with these basic legion types. The third command are like the dregs, primarily being frontline fighters and occupying forces. The second, equivalent to the shield legions, defend important things, people, and places, and as such, they would remain in charge of the river Styx for the devils. And the first commands, like the finisher sword legions, train for critical strikes and must-win situations. To reiterate, these are broad areas of authority. Duties will, in many cases, fall to whoever is nearest. 
These differing roles do, however, play a part in determining the composition of particular legions. Though each command is made up of Dreg, Shield, and Sword legions, a Dreg legion from the first command will have superior devils in it compared to a Dreg legion of the third. Now, having broken down the commands, there is another question to ask. Why are Dreg, Shield, and Sword units the basic types? This typing is of recent lore, and the unifying reason is hinted at but never fully drawn out. I will speculate again here and give my answer, which is, in short, the pincer maneuver. To begin with, let me read from the Legions of the Damned section in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. Quote, Most of the forces of the Nine Hells are grouped into three types of legions that each play a role in repelling the invading demons. Incompetent or weak devils fill out the Dreg legions, composed mainly of hordes of Lemures and Noparibos. They are deployed as a delaying tactic, serving as fodder to slow down an advancing horde of demons, while sword legions organize their counterattacks and shield legions establish their defenses." End quote. I read this as a modified pincer maneuver. While the version seen at the Battle of Canny in our world's history, for instance, involves the line of infantry giving way to their attackers before the pincer snaps shut, I believe that the devils instead allow their enemies to tear straight through the dreg units, having a similar effect to withdrawing and forcing the enemy to chase you and tire themselves out, as at Canny. Behind the dreg units are shield units, forming a solid wall to pin their opponents in place should the dregs be totally slaughtered. Once the opposing force is committed, sword units will come in at a flank to crush the trapped army. This idea is the basis of the legion composition I laid out in part 1. Legions as a whole are often typed in a similar way, but the dreg legion isn't made up only of dreg units. Legions have all they need to fight independently, which to me means that each would be able to pull off a version of this modified pincer. Typing for the legions, as well as for the commands, is more about the type of assignment they're likely to be given and their role in strategy. Now let's break down the military rank structure that I've assigned to the devils. Multiple sources have rankings of devils based on their might. In part 1, I talked some about the greater, lesser, least ordering, but there is also a detailed ordering in the most recent monster manual, as well as shifting ratings of a type of devil's threat to their adversaries. Hierarchy is integral to how devils see themselves. However, I feel that the structure as given in the sources is not fleshed out enough to describe how a society and military would operate. Using the recent monster manual for instance, should a Barbatsu at rank 4 be able to order around a Spinagon at rank 3, which is a lower rank in this uh, system, even though the Barbatsu fight grounded and Spinagons fight while flying? To me that seems a little bit nonsensical. A military rank structure provides a way for devils to retain useful forms, for example, Spinagons for flight, while still acknowledging changing positions in the day-to-day -day command structure. This way, an inferior form devil cannot be simply overruled by one in a more powerful form. In essence, this has to do with the rank structure tying them both to higher authorities. Without ranks, a Barbatsu probably could bully a Spinagon, but with ranks, a Barbatsu who did this would be directly acting against the wishes of those great devils responsible for the Spinagon's position. To be clear here, I am not invalidating the hierarchies given in the sources. Barbatsu are generally still more powerful than Spinagons, and lower tier devils still hope to assume better and better forms. The military rank structure is about devil society, how orders are transmitted, who commands who, and so on. That however, brings up a major hurdle in laying out a neat rank structure. How can a lower tier devil give orders to a higher tier one, or to take it from the other side, how can a high tier devil like a Malabranch have that form and yet not command others? Taking this into account, what I've talked about thus far as the single military rank structure for devils is in fact three separate tracks. First, the regular ranks which progress up the command chain and respect a strict rank hierarchy. Next, the special ranks occupied mostly by devils with special tasks such as scouts or torturers. 
Special troops do not necessarily accept orders from higher rank specialists or give orders to lower ranks, but they must accept the orders from a regular rank officer of a certain level, which is usually lower than their strict equivalent. For instance, a devil of the special rank master is equivalent to a regular prefect, but has to take orders from a centurion who is lower. Specialists can command, but only when they're specifically tasked with the unit, and only those troops are obligated to follow orders. And the third track, the auxiliary ranks, is used by the Abishai. These ranks are treated as rigidly as the devil regular ranks, but their advancement stops at the tribune rank, which commands cohort-sized units. To keep the Abishai from having a single united force that could challenge the devils, they have no rank which alone could command as much as a legion. So first of all, let's go through the regular ranks, and after that I'll go over the special and auxiliary ranks. I'll be using the contemporary US Army rank structure as a very, very rough analogy, uh, just so that you have a more immediate reference that you can, you know, look up yourself and um, sort of get an idea of what I'm talking about. At the lowest level of the devil military are what I would call thralls or perhaps beasts. This class includes devil forms such as the Zerfilstix and the Bezakira, creatures which couldn't really re be regimented. They can't, you know, you can't get a, uh, a Bezakira a Hellcat to form up in ranks and follow orders in the way that even a Nupariba would. Um, usually these wouldn't be counted, but sometimes they are taken into account, such as if a demon force was to invade a stretch of the sticks that was full of Zerfil sticks. When these creatures are counted, they fall into this group. The lowest actual rank in the regular system is that of conscript, which is equivalent to a US Army private. Conscripts give no orders, they only follow. While Noparibos and Lemures are obvious conscripts, even Hamachula can still be of conscript rank if they are in a more elite unit. The next rank up is that of veteran, equivalent to a modern corporal. They're also the first rank to have an insignia, though the fact that their downpointing angle looks like a V for veteran is a coincidence of English. In my view, these insignia would generally be burned into skin or made by scarification. This of course doesn't mean that one can't be demoted, changing the symbol back could be done in a number of ways, easily or painfully, but I won't go into that here. The idea with the insignia that I thought up is that they would be continually added to as one moves up the ladder. Back on track, above the rank of veteran is that of set leader, or simply leader. Leaders are roughly equal to US Army sergeants. Their symbol is a crossbar added to the top of the veteran's V shape, so that the symbol now looks like a single pennant hanging down from a line. Set leaders are almost always in command of a subunit called a set, having around 10 devils. Next is the rank of Centurion, equal to a US Army Captain or Major. They are the main unit leaders on the field, commanding bands, ideally having 200 devils. For an insignia, the leader symbol is extended into a downward pointing pentagram. Vice Prefects stand above Centurions, but their rank is seen primarily as the stepping stone to the next one, rather than being its own command position. While Vice Prefects can command, they usually only command detachments on assignment from their Prefect or a higher officer. Their symbol is the outline of a humanoid hand, palm forward, fingers up and together. This is placed above the finished Centurion symbol. Those of the next Prefect rank usually command cohorts of 1000 devils, or 5 bands. This rank's rough US Army equivalent is that of Colonel. Their symbol is made by adding a circle around the Vice Prefect symbol. Above Prefect is the rank of Vice Legate, which is to the Legate rank what the Vice Prefect is to the Prefect. The Vice Legate's insignia is made by adding another ring around the symbol of the Prefect. Those holding the rank of Legate will usually be in command of a whole legion, which for devils often has over 20,000 soldiers. 
The symbol of a legate is the outline of a skull, usually placed above that of the vice legate, so that altogether a legate is marked by a skull atop a twice encircled hand atop a downward pointing pentagram. Legates are about equal to major generals in the US Army. Major generals are expected to command 10 to 20,000 soldiers, according to the sources that I found. The three ranks above legate are what I'd call strategic ranks, responsible for multiple legions, as opposed to the tactical ranks below. As such, I don't believe that the insignia is necessary for these ranks, but you can assume at minimum that someone who holds these ranks has the legate symbols. Just above the rank of legate is that of commander, roughly equivalent to a US Army Lieutenant General. Commanders head divisions, which usually consist of 10 full legions. Above commander is the rank of governor, who controls a military province, which for this discussion is a formation of four divisions or about 40 legions. At the top of the regular rank hierarchy is the rank of general, of which there are only nine in all of double kind, three for each one of the three commands. A general's formation is called an army and is usually made up of four provinces, equaling 160 legions. This is, by a very conservative estimate, two and a half million devils under a single general's command. Knowing the exact numbers that the devils can field is difficult, but this gives us a framework to begin with. If you believe that these numbers are too small, I would suggest expanding the number of total legions, making more legions per division or more divisions per province without changing the legion structure. This structure works best if each legion remains in the range of tens of thousands and the low tens of thousands and not reaching into millions and such, purely due to the realities of communicating orders. Now, also keep in mind that the numbers that I'm giving here only apply to the active blood war forces. Inactive troops, in other words, civilians, have a rank and superior officer as I stated. If mobilized, they would come somewhere under the nine generals. That said, a full devil mobilization, whatever that would mean, is not planned for in these unit numbers. Therefore, you can assume that the devils have essentially limitless numbers of troops to draw on should they need to. However, I feel that the numbers that I give provide a good sense of the scale of the epic blood war battles. With the regular ranks finished, we'll move on to the special ranks. Uh, like I said before, each special rank has to obey those who hold a certain regular rank and above, but they don't have to obey other specialist troops unless they're assigned under them. Special ranks begin after the rank of veteran, starting with the rank of factotum, also called factor. Their symbol involves finishing the veteran's V-shape by making it into a diamond or lozenge. The next rank up is first factor, and their symbol is made by filling in the diamond shape. Both first factors and factotums answer to set leaders. Above first factor is the rank of submaster, whose insignia is formed by crossing the diamond diagonally from upper left to lower right. Submasters are superseded by masters. Usually when a special unit operates independently, a master is in charge, though they and submasters must take the orders of centurions. The insignia of a master is made by crossing the submaster line with the opposite diagonal. The rank of champion sits just above that of master. Elite bodyguards usually end at this rank unless they demonstrate different useful skills. The champion symbol adds a circle around the master's sign. Next highest is the rank of chief master, whose symbol is one short vertical line to both the left and right of the prior symbol. Chief masters and champions must answer to prefects. Above that is Master of Arms, which is to say weapons and not limbs. Although for devils, it could really be both. Their symbol is one short horizontal line both above and below the prior symbol, so that the four short lines form an incomplete square. This is then advanced to the rank of Master of Masters, whose insignia adds one dot at each empty corner of the square made earlier. These two ranks must take orders from regulars ranked legate and above. The highest special rank is Grandmaster. 
its symbol is made by adding one dot just outside the square on each of its sides. As Grandmasters only have to obey commanders and above, top advisors often hold this rank to keep them away from normal duties. With that, we conclude the overview of the special ranks and move into the auxiliary or Ibishai ranks. Those holding these ranks don't have any authority over regular or special troops. Adding to that, each auxiliary rank is pegged to a regular rank, having to obey all those holding that rank and above, outside any other orders. The Abishai equivalent of the conscript is the rank of peon, which similarly has no insignia. Next is advanced peon, equivalent to a veteran. This rank's symbol is a small, downward-pointing, three-pronged fork. Above this, and across from the regular rank of Set Leader, is the auxiliary rank of Vice Captain. Its sign is an up-pointing arrow made of two lines, also known as a chevron shape, which are placed above the prior rank's fork. Above this is Captain, near equal to a Centurion. A Captain adds a second chevron just above the first. The rank of Vice Tribune is just above Captain and stands equivalent to a regular Vice Prefect. Its insignia is a third chevron placed above the first two. The top auxiliary rank is that of Tribune, which is near equal to a regular Vice Legate and outranking a regular Prefect. Tribunes command cohorts, which as I said earlier is the largest unit type the Abishai are allowed to field. The Tribune sign adds two additional vertical lines, one joining the left points of the chevrons and the other joining the right points. The Abishai themselves recognize more gradations for prestige among themselves, but even a so-called Grand Tribune still has to answer to any Vice Legate. Now, to provide a cap for this overview of the Devil Military, I'm going to give a brief breakdown of sample legions from the Second and First Commands, giving an idea of what types of Devil would make the legions up. If you want an idea of which Devil forms would hold positions in the Third Command, that was the bulk of Part 1, so go check that episode out for those details. I also covered the Abishai Auxiliary Contingent in that episode, and you can assume that each of the legions I'm presenting here will have a similar group of auxiliaries with them. As I said before, the Second Command is broadly focused on defense and has jurisdiction over the River Styx, so I'm going to give this legion two new cohort types, Spine Cohorts and Arrow Cohorts, while taking out the Machine Cohort I laid out last time. The general to whom our legion's legate ultimately answers is likely to be an Amnitsu, and the governor and commander will be Amnitsu as well. The legate will be a Gelugon, supported by a bodyguard of 100 Hamachula. The legate's secretary is a Brachina, holding the rank of champion and aided by 10 Spinagons. This legion will have 22 cohorts, plus their specialist units. There will be eight dreg cohorts, the foot soldiers being Barbatsu. Each band within the cohort is led by an Osuluth Centurion, and each dreg cohort is led by an Osuluth Vice Prefect. The slight lowering in rank is due to the low status of dreg units. The three shield cohorts will each be made up of two Orthon bands and three Barosa bands. Both types of band are led by Osuluth Centurions, and an Osulith also commands the cohort as prefect. As a quick aside, the high number of Osuliths in quote unquote junior officer roles is also gone into in part one. The three sword cohorts are each to be composed of two Malabranch bands and three Narzagon bands. The Malabranches are led by Malabranch Centurions and the Narzagons by Narzagon Centurions while a Malabranch directs them all as Prefect. Now for the two new unit types. First are the Arrow Cohorts, which you can think of like blocks of archers from the history of our world. Archers are indispensable in defense operations and they can also strike over distances, making them key in fighting on water. This legion will have four arrow cohorts, each having two Orthon bands and three Maragon bands. 
Once again, all five band centurions and the cohort prefect are osculoths. The second new unit type is the spine cohort, which there are also four of. The spine cohort is named for the spinagons, specifically their ability to shoot spines. The cohort's role is as an aerial skirmish force, able to disrupt almost any kind of opponent and then rapidly retreat. These units are made entirely of spinagons, including their five centurions and the vice prefect in overall command. This second command legion also has four units of specialists. The searching force is 1,000 osculoths strong, spread across six boats. They are charged with quick recon and transport over water. Their leader is an osculoth at the special rank of master. There is also a thousand strong land-based recon force made up of spinagons with an orthon master in charge. An interrogation section of six excruciarchs is assigned to the legion with the excruciarch master in nominal control. And finally, for this legion, there is a messenger force of about 100 imps directed by a Foxagon first factor. Moving on to the sample legion of the first command, the general, governor, and commander who stand over this legion will all be pit fiends. The legate will be a cornugon protected by 100 gelugons. Aid to the legate is a Pelerion teeth master with a small staff of falxugons. There are five cohort types in this legion for a total of 26 legions, plus three small specialist units. This legion will have 10 dreg cohorts. Every such cohort is composed of three Barbatsu bands and two Maragon bands. All bands are led by Malabranch Centurions, and the cohort as a whole is commanded by a Malabranch Prefect. There will be five shield cohorts, each made up of three Baroza bands and two Gelugon bands. The Gelugons are led by Gelugon Vice Prefects, but the Barozas are led by Malabranches of that same rank. The prefect in overall command is a Gelugon. There are also five sword cohorts, each one commanded by a Malabranch prefect. Three of the bands in each are of Nartugons and two are of Malabranches, but Malabranches again hold all five band leadership posts as vice prefect. This legion will also field two machine cohorts based around the Hellfire engines. Each machine cohort will have five engine forces to escort the machines, each force made up of Barbatsu and led by a Malabranch Vice Prefect. Each one will also have a repair force of 500 Spinagons led by a Malabranch Centurion. The overall leader of each machine cohort is a Malabranch at the rank of Prefect. The last cohort type for this first command legion is another new type of cohort, the Vanguard Cohort. In size and purpose, each cohort is like a recon force, acting as scouts and skirmishers while also being strong enough to wage a sustained attack. A possible battlefield coup de grace might involve the machine cohorts attacking, followed by the vanguards and then the sword cohorts. The legion will have four vanguard cohorts, each made up of three orthon bands and two Nartsugan bands. All five Vice Prefect brand leaders, as well as the Prefect and Cohort Command, are to be Malabranches. This first command legion has three specialist units, as I stated earlier. The first is their messenger force, led by a Malabranch chief master and staffed by Falksugans. The legion has a sizable interrogation section of over two dozen excruciarchs under another Malabranch chief master. The last special unit is a summoning force, which enables the Legion to be much more flexible in how they operate, using the summoners to bring troops instantly across vast distances and even across plains. This summoning force is led by an Amnitsu holding the rank Master of Masters, while the other hundred are mostly Brachinas. And with that final detail, we have come to the end of this overview of the Devil Military. Remember. I am mostly trying to fill in gaps that I see in the sources with some speculation. Not every devil formation will look like this. That is for you to discover on your adventures. Soon I will return with a look into the way that the demons organize themselves for the blood war. I expect that this one will only need one part, but we'll see how it all eventually turns out. 
if you have any uh, elements of the Blood War that you'd like me to look into, definitely reach out to me in the comments. I have been your narrator, Jay Anwuka, and thank you for listening. Thanks.